Okay, chapter four. As I mentioned on Friday, chapter two, three, four, and five is going to describe the experience of the godly soul, the nefesh elokit, what we always refer to as the neshama. Right? We learned already that a person has two neshamas, godly soul, the animal soul. The animal soul is just you being a regular person that thinks about themselves. And then we start to learn over chapter two, three, four, and five, what the godly soul is all about. So generally speaking, when you talk to someone, you say neshama, you usually mean this, right? When you say a person's neshama is feeling connected, you're not talking about his animal soul, you're talking about his godly soul, obviously, right? So in chapter two, we described what the nefesh alikit is, what the neshama is at its core. At its core, it's godliness. And we compare the two DNA in a body. Even if you have a bunch of different parts of the body, you still have one and the same DNA. So likewise, even if you have a bunch of levels of Jews, different levels, different levels of neshamas, different types of neshamas, different type of people who have different kinds of connection to Hashem, at the core, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew is a Jew because he has a godly neshama at the core. Then in chapter three, we talked a little bit about the neshama's personality. We explained that a personality is made up of two general parts, remember? Two parts of what? The, the mind, the heart, my intelligence, my emotions. And we explained right, that emotions are created by the intelligence. So it starts off with Chachma. Chachma is the idea. Once you have the idea, then you have to be not understand the idea. And then once you understand the idea, you have to make the idea so real to you, and then you start to feel for it. Right? So here's the example. The idea that Hashem is watching you. It's a simple idea, and we all know it. To understand how Hashem is watching me, why He's watching me, maybe yes, maybe no. But if I understand it, it doesn't mean I behave differently. I can understand very well how Hashem is watching me. But somehow, I'm not behaving the way I would if I really, really knew that Hashem was watching me. And that's the dot part. Not to understand it. I already understand it. I already have the idea. I have the Chachma and the Bina. The dot is to make it real. Make it real. To say it again and again in my mind to make it real. We use the example of, on the other side, someone who gets angry. Remember we use this example? Somebody slaps me across the face. First, I'm in shock. Now, when do I get angry? That's right. When I think about how terrible that person is. And the more I think about how terrible that person is, the more I get angry. So the anger didn't come from what the person did, but from how I thought about what that person did. Right? If I decided, we said this last time, if I decided, instead of thinking this guy is terrible, I think, poor guy. He needs to slap me to get happy. Imagine that's what I thought. Then I wouldn't be feeling anger, I'd be feeling pity. Right? So it all depends not on what happened, but on how I think about what happened. And the same thing is true of my connection to Hashem. The fact that Hashem watches me doesn't move me, but how I think about it will change. So after I know the truth, whatever the idea is, in this case, we use an example, Hashem is watching me, but it could be Hashem loves me. It's also a simple idea. But to understand it, and then to feel it to the point that I love Hashem back, it's a different story, right? So there's the idea of the Chachma, and then I have to understand the idea, and then I have to think about the idea to the point that it becomes real for me. And now I feel. That's the nefesh alakit, the godly soul's personality. Understanding Hashem and feeling for Hashem. Love, fear, etc. Clear? Yes? That was chapter three. Now in chapter four, we're going to get to what does the neshama do with all these feelings? So it has love for Hashem and it has fear of Hashem. What does it do now with it? Hmm? What does it do now that it loves Hashem? What does it do with it? Huh? Praise it. Do mitzvot? Yeah, do now. Hashem wants. If I love Hashem, or I'm in fear of Hashem, I want to do what He wants. And I don't want to betray Him. Right? That's right. Not a big deal. But this is what the Nefesh Lakis does. If you didn't have a Nefesh Bahamut, if you didn't have an animal selfish side to you, this is how you would feel. 
right? So now we're describing this in Nefesh HaLakit. Soon we're going to describe the Nefesh Bahamut, and then we're going to describe the battle between the two. But in theory, if we only had an Nefesh HaLakit in charge of our body, this is what we would feel? We would understand Hashem and love Hashem. What? Is it like an angel? Nesham, anaf, no, no. The Nefesh HaLakit? Yeah, no. Not like, oh, an, like an angel, no. An angel is more like an animal. Right. Yeah. That's what, we, that's, that's what we say. How do you translate Chayot HaKodesh? Yeah, holy animals, exactly. Why are they called animals? Because they're instinctual. Their instinct is to serve Hashem. And Hashem has to do free choice. And Hashem has to work to feel for Hashem. For an angel, it's instinct. Right? Besides the fact that you don't, your Hashem, in order to feel for Hashem, has to fight in the Bahamas, which makes it even harder. We would be like angels, but not exactly. The difference is an angel is created by Hashem, like an animal, and the Neshama is part of Hashem. And the Neshama for sure is much more important than an angel. For sure, not even a question. Sorry? Oh, Yoah Navi. Yeah, he had a Neshama, sure. That's why he's like a link between heaven and earth. Because he had a Neshama, he had a body, but he's living in heaven. Right? That's why he's a link. Right? Okay. So now that the Neshama has all these feelings for Hashem, now it has to act on those feelings. Okay? So let's see. Parag Dal, chapter 4. Every Nefesh Lekis has Shloy Shalavushim, three, what we know the Lavushes? Garments, clothing. Does the Neshama need clothing? A body needs clothing. So what's the clothing of the neshama? Let's see. Shehem, let's see. Machshava, dibur, or maisa. Thought, speech, and action. There's one thing we described in Pera Gimel in chapter 3 is the neshama's personality. The personality is made up of its mind, what it understands, and its heart, what it feels. But then there is something else. Your thought and your speech and your action. Your thought, speech, and action are not the same thing as your feelings. For sure, your action is not the same thing as your feelings because sometimes you feel very one way, but you act a completely different way. And same thing's for sure true of speech. You can feel one way, but hold your tongue and not say anything or say something nice when you're feeling something else, right? So your speech and your action are for sure not the same thing as your feelings or even your understanding. You can understand something one way and say it a different way. Or you can say silly things too. It has nothing to do with your mind. Right? So your neshama itself, its personality, its understanding, feelings. But then there's speech and action. What about thought? Is thought the same thing as where you understand things? It's very close, but it's not exactly the same thing. Why is it not the same thing? Because you could also think about silly things. And you can think about things that you don't feel. And you can feel something and decide I'm not thinking about it. And you can think about something in a different way than you understand it. And here's the most important part. You can decide at any moment what you want to think about. To decide at any moment what you want to feel about is very difficult. If you love something, it's very difficult to switch it off and say, I don't love it anymore. It's very difficult to do that. Right? But your thoughts, that's much easier. You love something, but you can decide, I'm not thinking about it because I know that thing that I love is bad for me. So I'm not going to think about it, even if I still love it. Understand? So your thoughts, speech, and action, that's why it's called clothing. In the same way, clothing, you can take it on and off and change it. Same thing with thoughts, speech, and action. You can change it. Your feelings, much harder to change. Your ideas, also very hard to change, to change the way you understand things. It's very difficult to do that. People work their life to do that. But the way you think, what you're thinking, what you're speaking and what you're doing, that's something you can do. And that's why it's called lavush. That's why it's called clothing, because you can take it on and off. You can switch it up. Right? So, that's, so let's, let's break this down. There's the essence of the neshama, the neshama itself. It's godly. There's the neshama's personality. 
its mind and its heart. And then there is the Neshama's clothing. And they are three things. Thought, speech, and action. Those are the three clothing. Now, if you're talking about the Neshama, the godly soul, what kind of thought, speech, and action is its clothing? Thoughts of Torah, words of Torah and prayer, and the actions of mitzvahs. That would be the clothing of the nefesh of nefesh is. Now, here's another reason why it's called clothing. You put your body inside of clothing. And that's what the neshama does with speaking to Hashem. It takes all of its feelings of love for Hashem and puts it into the words of Torah. Ah, good question. We're going to get that in chapter five. What the food of the neshama is. It's a good question. Very, very good. We're going to, we're going to learn that. So let's, let's use an example, a physical example, not the godly soul's example, an example from a human, from the Nefesh Muhammad, just a human example. Let's just say, there's th three words, I love you. Simple words, right? Just three words, just, I'm just mouthing words, that's all I'm saying, right? It's just sounds bouncing, out, bouncing around my mouth and making these sounds, right? If I told it to a Chinese person, it means nothing. Right? It only means something to someone who speaks English. Correct? Okay. Now, when I say it right now, I said those words. I love you. It's just simple words, right? What does it mean? Nothing. It's an idea I'm talking about. What if I say the same words to my children? Now it means something else. So what changed? Not the words. The words are the exact same. The same three words. I said it here and I said it to my children. Huh? It's not just understanding. What is it? I, what did I put inside of it? What did I put inside of the words when I said it here now? Nothing. I just put an explanation. Or what, what did I put into the words when I said it to my children? I put into it my feelings. Right? I put into it my real feelings. Not just my real feelings. My attachment to my children. Right? We talked about in chapter 2 that children are an extension of you. Right? Your children are an extension of you. That's why you have such a deep love for them. So when I say those words to my children, it's much, much more. And that's why it's like clothing. I take my emotions and I put it inside of words. Like clothing. I put my body into clothing. Following? So you can take your feelings, you can take your ideas, and you can put them inside of thoughts. You can put them inside of words, and you put them inside of actions. I give a gift to somebody. Right? Let's say I give a gift to someone I've never met in my life. And I bring a bottle of wine because I'm invited to their house. It's a nice gesture. But how much meaning is in their bottle of wine? Oh, the only meaning is there is that I'm appreciative of the person, that, the fact that the person hosted me. That's the whole meaning, right? right? But what happens if I buy my best friend a gift? I buy my best friend a gift. I know my friend for years. So when I buy them a gift, am I going to buy a random bottle of wine? No. I'm going to find, I, I, I know the thing that he likes. I know this one thing that he was talking about he really wanted to get. Right? And I'm going to buy it for it. It costs the same $5 or $10, whatever it costs. It's the, same, it's the same action. I took a bottle of wine. I gave it to my host. I took a, whatever, the, whatever the thing this, my friend likes and I gave it to the person. And it costs the same much money. But what's the difference? What kind of feeling and understanding is going into that action? in the action of giving a gift to a, a guest, to a host I never met before, I'm just invited to their house, I'm polite and I'm bringing a bottle of wine or, or a bouquet of flowers. I'm just doing it because I'm nice, I'm gratitude. But when I'm talking about giving my best friend, who I know for 20 years, giving them a gift, a thoughtful gift, because I really know who they are and I really know what, they, what he wants, now and it's not just an action. My ideas are in the action, my thoughts in the action, my feelings are in that action. Like clothing, I put myself into clothing. Right? Clear? And the same thing with clothing, depending on what you're trying to do, you put on different clothing. Right? If you're going to work, depends what kind of work you have. If you're a doctor, you're wearing a doctor's coat. And if you're, uh, if you're a construction guy, you're wearing a hard hat and, uh, and uh, overall jeans. Right? It's the same person, same body. But when you're going to be act engaging the world around you, you put on different clothing. If you're a rabbi, you have to wear white, white shirts like this, right? 
from going swimming, I'm not wearing this, right? So depending on what you're doing, you wear different clothing. Depending on what you react, right? Even though my heart and my emotions are the same, whether I'm wearing this thing or I'm going swimming. It's the same me, same body of me. So when, so same thing is true of when I'm talking to my best friend, there's one kind of words I use, I'm talking to these different kind of words I use. It's still the same me, but different words, like different clothing. Very much matters. Of course it matters. The same way words matter. The same way action matters. I mean, actual clothing? Yeah, yeah. Of course, what's more important is how you feel, what you're doing, but clothing still matters. Right? Um, the Gemara says that Yosef would call his clothing Mahbuda, my honor. His dignity, your dignity comes from your clothing. The way you present yourself, you're walking, right? You're not going to wear what you're wearing now if you're going to go meet the Prime Minister of Canada, right? What's the difference? It's the same you. Who cares about your clothing? But it makes a difference the way, the way you present yourself, right? Same thing is true of words and actions and thoughts. Their clothing, their ways in which I can put my feelings and my ideas into. And for different occasions, I have different words and different actions and even different thoughts. Like clothing. Get it? Clear? That's why thought, speech, and action is called clothing. It's very important to remember this. There's the essence of the neshama, the etzim neshama, the neshama itself, the godly DNA. And then there's the neshama's personality, its, idea, its understanding, and its, its feelings. And then there is the neshama's clothing, thought, speech, and action. Clear? Okay. Now, if we're talking about the neshama nefesh the godly soul, its clothing is what? The thought, speech, and action of... Torah and mitzvahs, because that's its feeling, because it's for Hashem, it's godly, right? Then animal souls, thought, speech, and action is everything else I do. Playing sports, shopping, making a living, going to school. It depends what you're doing in school. If you're learning Torah, it's the godly soul. If you're not, otherwise, it's not, right? Ah, exactly. Now you're going the right way. Now you're starting to understand what the altar is trying to do. Exactly. In later chapters, when we get to the struggle between the godly soul and the animal soul, the altar is going to teach us that the animal soul is not your enemy. You have to use your animal soul to serve Hashem. Exactly, exactly, exactly right. This is where we're going. Very, very good. Clear? See, this is the question you guys asked before means your understanding. I'm happy to hear it. What was the question you asked before? You asked another question. Oh, what's the, what's the, what's the food of the neshama? We're going to learn about that. And that too, how the nefesh of Muhammad is not the enemy, but how you use it for serving Hashem. That's, what, that's going to come up um, soon. So very good. But let's now see what's the thought, speech, and action of the Nefesh Elokit. Machshavah Debevah is the thought, speech, and action. Shel Tayag Mitzvah Of the 630 mitzvahs of the Torah. That's its thought, speech, and action. It's thinking about the Torah mitzvahs. It's speaking about Torah mitzvahs and doing Torah mitzvahs. That's the godly soul's thought, speech, and action. Clear? So let's explain. This is something we said before about the clothing. And I put the feelings into my actions. I put the feelings into my speech. I put the feelings into my thought. So you can explain that now. When a person fulfills an action, call mitzvahs maizis, all the mitzvahs that require action. And in his speech, he is busy talking about the explanation of all the mitzvahs and the halachas. And in his thoughts, he tries to understand as best as he can all the levels of Torah. Do you know how many levels there are of Torah, by the way? It's the word pardus. You know what pardus means? Pardus is a garden. You know, I spell pardus in Lashon HaKadosh. Pe, Reish, Dalet, Samach. So it's four levels. Pardus, Pe, stands for Pshat. What does Pshat mean? Simple explanation of the Torah. Dala Reish stands for Remez. What's Remez mean? It's deeper. What's Remez mean? A hint. A hint. Not the Torah says straight up. But if you look closely, you'll find something. Like a Gematria is a hint. It's a hint. It's Remez. Is always right? that, uh, not always. Someone can make one up. Right? But a good Remez, a true Remez is, is a, like a hint. A, gematria is, a true Gematria is like a Remez. That's Reish. Dalad is drush. What does drush mean? Like, like medrash. Like a medrash. 
Sorry? Diuk. A diuk means to point something else precisely. You can have a diuk on every level. You have a diuk in Kshat, a diuk in Remez, a diuk in Drush. So Drush is deeper. That's the level of Midrash. And then you have Samach is Sod. What's Sod? Secret. Which level of Torah is that? Kabbalah Hasidut. That's Sod. Okay. What? Yeah? Different types of miracles, yeah. Okay, so when a person uses his thought to think of all the levels of Torah as best as he can, and he uses his mouth to talk about Torah, and he uses his action to act on the mitzvahs, then, then the totality of his body, and there are, in Torah, we know that there are 613 parts of the body. Why 613 parts of the body? For six. Then all my 613 parts of my body are invested, are put into the 613 mitzvahs. My hand is put into tefillin. My whole body is put into Shabbos. My lips are put into Torah, into prayer. For uh, tons of mitzvahs, yeah. Sure, tzedakah. Tzedakah is even more. Because how did you get that money? You have to work. So everything you did to work is also put into the tzedakah, right? The money doesn't come out of anywhere. It come out of nowhere, right? So there's a whole, all these parts of your life and all these parts of your body can be put into mitzvahs. There's even a book. I think it's called, it's a sefer called, I think it's called Sefer Charedim, I think. Yeah. And it goes through all the entire body and explaining how each part of your body could be used for a mitzvah. Every part. And that's what the Nefshul kid wants. What does a godly soul want? It is a godly thing. It understands godly and loves godliness. So what does it want? It wants every single part of my body to put into every single mitzvah. Every thought, every speech, and every action I do should be only mitzvah. That's what it wants. Right? Ube Pratis, and let's get specifically. Prinas Chabad the mind of the nefesh, right? Then we said the mind, the nefesh itself has two parts of the personality, the mind and the heart. So the mind of the nefesh is put into into the thoughts of Torah. Whatever you can understand of Torah, depends on what level and how much, how capable he's of understanding. Yeah. It has to get cleaned up. We're going to learn about that in chapter 8. That's why, why and how the neshama has to go to Gehenna to get cleaned up. If, it, if in this world it was part of the things that were not so good, it has to get cleaned up. We're going to learn about that. That's true. Godliness goes to, to low places because of our Avedas. Now you understand how bad an Aveda is. You're taking your godly soul and you're bringing it into a terrible place. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Okay. So the mind of the nefesh, alokit, is put into the thoughts of Torah. Ba'amidus and the feelings of the nefesh alokit, shen yira va'ava, anfein, which is love and fear of Hashem, melubesh is bekim ha'mitzis b'maisa, v'dibur, it's put into the actions and speech of Torah, right? The love that the nefesh alokit feels for Hashem, it puts into the words of prayer to, say, to tell Hashem he loves him, and the feelings he puts into mitzvah to do it with real love, right? Not just to give a gift to somebody, but to, like, but like, like imagine your tefillin was giving a gift to someone you loved. Right? Be a whole different tefillin. And especially in Talmud Torah, putting one's love of Hashem into the study of Torah, she can negate kulon, because Torah, of course, is equal to all the mitzvahs. You know this already. Kia ava, because love, I'm going to do a few more lines and then explain the rest of the chapter outside because we're running out of time. Okay, let's explain a little bit. Let's explain what's going on. So until now, what we said was that right now, if I had to ask you, what's the point of a mitzvah? Right now, what would you say? Sir Hashem, based on what we said in this chapter, what's the mitzvah? When I do a mitzvah, 
It's to put the love that the godly soul has into action. It's all about expressing the love the neshama has for Hashem. That's what you would say right now if, we, if the chapter ended here, right? And that the neshama itself has understanding of God. It loves God, but it, you know, in order to do something with it, it's got to put it somewhere. So it puts it into thought, speech, and action of Torah and mitzvahs. So if that's the case, what would be higher? The action of the mitzvah or the love the person feels for Hashem? What's greater? The love I feel for my children or the words I tell my children I love you? The love. But the words are just a way for me to get my love to them. Right? So really you would think at this point that the, that the highest thing is the neshama's feelings for Hashem. But it's got to put the feelings somewhere. So it puts it into, into Torah and mitzvahs. Right? But at this point you would think that the feelings the neshama has is higher. Comes the second half of the chapter in chapter four and says, that's true. It's true from my experience, my love of Hashem is so much greater to me than the action. But that's only if the focus is on me. If the focus is on me, then yeah, what's more important is how I feel. And then the action is something else, just because I need to put my feelings somewhere. But what if I'm thinking about not me, but Hashem? What's more important to Hashem? Doing what he wants. So using the example for my children. For me, my feelings for them are much more important than the words I say, I love you. But to my kid, what's more important? That I say the words. Because if I don't say the words, very nice. <laughs> I, I, you know, either he knows I have the feelings, I'm sure he does, Maybe he doesn't know I have a feeling, but he's not getting it. So if I'm thinking about me, then how I feel is more important. But if I'm thinking about the other person that I'm feeling for, then what's much more important is, do I act on that feelings? Do I speak that feelings? Do I tell my children that I love them? Do I give them gifts? I can mess up, sure. But we're talking about the godly soul in its perfect place, right? We're talking about before the animal soul starts to mess up with the godly soul. The godly soul in his perfect way. So now let's think about this with Hashem. From the Neshama's perspective, its feelings are greater. But from Hashem's perspective, you got to do the act of the mitzvah. Because if you don't, you didn't connect to him. You can love Hashem from today till tomorrow. Does that mean you're any closer to Hashem? How much? Hashem, we said, we explained this in chapter two. Hashem is beyond anything we can possibly imagine. Right? It's not only like when you meet a smart person, the person is so smart you can't understand the person. Or you see somebody who's so loving. His love is so big, I can never experience love like that. Right? There are such people like that. Right? You look at an artist, you're blown away with the person's art. I can't, I can't do that. Could you pick up a crayon and color on the page? Yes. So then you and that artist have something in common. You both can take pencils and write on the page. You're not so good at it. And he's very good at it. I don't know if you guys are artists or not. I have no idea. I'm just using it as an example. Right? So you're both in the same ballpark. You're both in the same world because you both know how to color on the, on the paper. You're just not so good at it. And he's way better than you. So is that how we look at Hashem? That I have brains, but Hashem's brains is much bigger than mine. Now, Hashem created brains. Hashem created a uh, uh, intelligence. So how is it possible for me to ever get close to Hashem? I can love as much as I want, the biggest kind of love in the entire world for Hashem. I, it's, I, there's no connection because he's not, he created love. Not just created Torah, much more than that. Not just created Torah, he created the world. What did he do in Torah and mitzvahs? He put himself into it. Ah, now I'm connecting to Hashem. Not because I'm so smart and that's why I can connect to Hashem. But because He gave it to me. I'll give you an example. I don't know, who's your, who's your hero? Like a, I don't know, a politician, a sports figure, a mathematician, I don't know. 
someone who's like out of the ballpark. Let's just say, I don't know. Let's just say you met, um, you met President, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. I don't know if you guys like him or not. Let's say you met, a, you met Stephen Harper. You met them both together. What's the connection I have with these guys? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's still connection. But if, if they turn to me and say, Levy, can you pass the water, please? And I pass the water. Do we make a connection now? Yeah. Yes. Because that person asked me to do something and I did it. So I can feel for Hashem from today till tomorrow. It's not going to get me any closer to Hashem. Because you and the Prime Minister are far apart, but you and Hashem are much more far apart. Because you and the Prime Minister is like the difference between you scribbling on the page and the artist. He's a much greater artist, but you're both scribbling on pages. You're not doing so well and he's doing much better. But Hashem is beyond any of this. So how could my feelings or my understanding of Hashem get me any closer to him? It can't. But then when Hashem says, listen, my dear child, can you do me a favor, please? Do you want to keep Shabbos, please? And then you do it. Now you made a connection. Because he asked you to do it. And not just he asked you, he put himself into it. He put himself into into mitzvahs and Torah. And that's another reason why mitzvahs and Torah are called clothing. In the same way, I take my feelings for Hashem. And where do I put it? I put it into a mitzvah, right? I put my feelings into speech, into actions, and into, th into thoughts. Hashem puts himself into Torah mitzvahs also. It's Hashem's clothing. It's even more than Hashem's clothing. It's like Hashem's arm. When you put on tefillin, when you put on tzitzis and when you keep Shabbos, imagine it like this. You're giving Hashem a hug. It's true. But if you gave the king a hug, does it make a difference if he's wearing a shirt, a jacket and a shirt, or a jacket, a shirt, and a coat? It doesn't make a difference. The point is the king is in there. Right? What I'm saying is that clothing is a way of presenting yourself to people, to people around you. So, you so Torah mitzvah Hashem's way of presenting himself to me and you. You would think We're going to get to food in the next chapter tomorrow. We're going to get tomorrow to food. It is. It's interesting. We'll get to food in a minute. But now we're looking at the clothing idea because the, what the clothing does is it presents me to you. It's true, but the way I present myself to you is through clothing. So the way Hashem presents himself to me is through his mitzvahs. And when I do a mitzvah, it's like I'm giving Hashem a hug, shaking his hand. Imagine you think of mitzvahs that way. How much more excited you would be to do them? Not, not you know, uh, Hashem asked me to do it. It's such a, I'm not interested. He's going to reward me. Okay, do I think the reward's worth it? Maybe right now it's not worth it. Maybe it is worth it. But then when you come here and you learn in chapter four of Tanya, that a mitzvah is not some annoying thing that Hashem is asking you to do because he wants to reward you. Hashem is saying, can you please hug me? That's what Hashem is saying when he asks me to do a mitzvah. Hashem is infinite. And I'm this little guy. How are we supposed to connect? Hashem says, you know, I, want, I really want to connect to you. Here's how we're going to do it. Can you please put this on in the morning? Can you please say these words in the morning? When you do that, we're going to connect. That's what it is. That's what a mitzvah is. And when you think about it that way, which one's greater? My love for Hashem or my acting for Hashem? Am I doing a mitzvah? Yeah. What? Yeah. So from my perspective, my love feels like much more. But from Hashem's perspective, which one connects me to him? Yeah. When I do what he wants. When I do what he wants. If I loved Hashem and didn't do mitzvahs, it's like me loving my children and never telling them I love you. I love them for tomorrow, but they're never getting it. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry? Yeah. That's right. So when I love Hashem, to me it feels much more amazing. But if I don't do something for Hashem, I'm never expressing my love to him. He's never, he's never getting the love from me. We're never, we're never, I'm never giving him a hug. I'm never telling it to him. And love, yeah, love and fear are both emotions. So fear and love are two types of emotions for Hashem. 
One is I don't want to do something wrong against him, and one is I want to connect to him. Sure. But unless I do a mitzvah, so scared. scared of what though? Hashem. Scared of Hashem. Scared of ah, so scared of Hashem is different than scared of punishment. Scared of so let's let, let's think about this. That's a good question. Let, let's think about this for a second. What does scared of punishment mean? Does it mean I care for the mitzvah? No, I don't care for the mitzvah. I'm just scared of the consequence of the mitzvah. So if I can get away with it and not get punished, would I do that? Probably, right? Because that's what, that's what being scared of a, a punishment means. It means I don't care really for the action. It's just that it's so not worth it because if I did this action, I'm going to get punished. But if I knew that Hashem was going to let me get scot free, let's say Hashem announced to me and said, I'll give you a day off, no punishment, do whatever you want. Right? So it's not that I care for what Hashem or for his mitzvahs. I'm just worried about the consequences. For Tanya, Atavi says, that, that's, not a, that's not the way you connect to Hashem. That's the wrong way of thinking about mitzvahs. So oh, now let's think what that means. What does scared of Hashem mean? And that's a different story. I'm not scared of punishment. I'm in awe of Hashem. So let's think about it. What does that mean, scared? I'm scared what? But, but what does that mean? What does it mean to be scared of Hashem? Before we get into... That he's gonna, he's gonna hurt me. Because he's gonna hurt me. Then it means I'm scared of punishment. So let's, let's think about that. No, you're right. But let's think about it. So imagine, imagine you guys are sitting around here and, and playing a game. You're playing a game. Nothing bad. You weren't doing anything bad. We're just playing a game. And in walked the chief rabbi of Israel. What would you do? Stand up. Because you're afraid he's gonna do something to you. No. It's it's a certain respect when you're in the presence of greatness that you behave properly. Right? You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's, that's what it means to be afraid of. To, I'll give you one, just give one second. That's what it means to truly be afraid of Hashem. It doesn't mean afraid like, oh, I'm scared he's going to slap me. That's not being afraid of Hashem. That's just me being afraid of suffering myself. So I'm not afraid of Hashem. I'm afraid of myself. I'm afraid of my own pain. And Hashem happens to be strong enough to give me pain. And if Hashem told me, today you get scot free, then I would probably take him up on the opportunity and do all the areas I want because I'm not getting punished anyway. But if I think of Hashem, he's standing right next to me, right here. He's right here. A lot of respect. That's what it is. Not that I'm afraid of what he's gonna do to me. I'm in awe of his presence. That's a different kind of fear, right? That's truly to be afraid of Hashem. Scared. Right, so this is what's called Yirat covered. It's a fear of the greatness, not fear of, the, of what he's going to do. It's more like awe. You know what awe means? Awe means like you're wowed. You're wowed by the person who just walked in here. You have to like be respectful. That's truly what it means to be in, afraid, to be in awe of Hashem. Right? Or, sorry, what did you say? What did you say? Love or fear, you have to have both. We're going to learn in Sichet, you have to have both. Person has to love Hashem and I want to connect him. And because I love him so much, I don't want to, God forbid, betray him. Let me know if you think about it this way. Like, why don't you want to do something bad to your best friend? You're afraid your best friend is going to hate you? It's, it's, what are you afraid of then? You're afraid of losing your friend. So it's really your love that's making you afraid. It's not you're afraid that you're because you're scared. You just have a certain respect of who the person is because you love them. And you don't want to do something against them. You understand? So that's what difference between that's that's what it means to love and fear of Hashem. So you love Hashem and therefore you do all the mitzvot, and you because you don't want to lose Hash, your connection to Hashem, you're afraid of losing the connection you have with Hashem, you're in awe of Hashem's presence, therefore you're not gonna do anything he doesn't want. So you're not gonna do any other. Understand? Is that why uh, a lot when someone dies, they don't uh, <clears throat> they don't like stop putting on stone, do they? It's not official. People do it without a bracha. That's a halacha thing. You know what I'm saying? So, but it could be connected. There's still the people still apart. So it's not like in the punishment. The punishment still stays apart. Sure. But it's not, you know, if it's not money, there's no punishment. It doesn't mean you can marry for it. You're not going to do as much. So from this perspective, you'll do the exact same thing. And there's a story about Shem Tov. It's a long, long story, but the story, the short part of the story is like this. He, there was a, he gave a blessing to a certain couple to have children. They didn't have children for many years. And he gave them a blessing to have children. 
Now, in Shamayim, they decreed that the Bashamta loses his Gan Eden, loses his Olam Haba. Why? Yeah, why? Because this, per, this couple, their Neshama, in Shamayim, they made a decree that this couple can't have children. Long story because of Gilgul, whole long story. But in Shamayim, they decided this couple can't have children. And the Bashamta went to give him blessing anyway. So he broke the rule. And the, the couple had children. They had a child, I think, one child. So Bashamta broke the rule. So because they broke the rule in Shamayim, they said, Bashamta, no more Gan Eden for you. You know what the Bashamta said? He started dancing from joy. Why? Because now he can serve Hashem properly. Because till now, maybe he was serving Hashem because he wanted the reward. But now that he has no more reward, fantastic. Every, every mitzvah I do is for real, just for Hashem. Hmm? I don't know what happened to him after he passed away. I don't know if he got the Ganeidin in or not. I don't know. But the point of the story is that he, the fact that he understood that the real way to serve Hashem is not for reward and punishment, but it's because I love Hashem. I, imagine, sorry? I don't know. I can't tell you. I don't know. I was never there. I don't know. I don't know. But so I'll give you an example. Another example. Right? When you're a little child, when you're, when you're two or three years old, and your parents tell you to pick this up, do that. Right? So why do you do it? You do it because your parents are going to give you a candy, or you're going to, you know, your parents are going to reward you, or your parents are going to ground you if you don't listen. Right? But at a certain point, why are, you, why are you taking a plate off the table when your mother asks you? Not because you're afraid she's going to punish you. You're already an adult. At this point in time, right now, me, my parents are not going to punish me if I don't help, them, help clean up after, after supper. So why do I do it? Because my mother, I have a little respect for her. Right? I love her. She made supper. So I'm going to thank her and clean up afterwards. Punishment, reward. It's not, it's not part of the equation. When I'm younger, I'm a little child, and my parents are training me to be mensch, to be, to be, to be you know, a, a good, decent human being. So they're giving me punishments and rewards for these things. But as you get older, it's like, the same thing is true of our relationship with Hashem. On one level, you're right. You, know, you start out and you have to think about reward and punishment and it's reminding you to keep you on track. But really, what we should really be hoping, what we should really be looking forward to is a connection with Hashem that's based on a true love and fear because I love Hashem and I'm afraid, because I'm an, and I have respect for Hashem. It's, 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 it's rare. It's like, it's like tomorrow morning I get a drone. Uh, to wherever it looks at. Mm. I love, 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 love. Mm-hmm. I love, but I'm also working on McDonald's for the money. Mm-hmm. Work. If I don't try to quit tomorrow, I'm not going to be able to finish in my mm-hmm. So you're saying there could be a combination of both? It has to. There could be a combination of both. It has to. Yeah. If I only do it with the love of McDonald's, I only work at five on my McDonald's a day, it's a matter of every day. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, there are people who put much more work in their hobbies than they do in their jobs. Why? Because their jobs they hate, and they're doing it just because they need the paycheck. And they come home and they go to their hobby, this is what they really like doing. So they put much more work. Even if it's not making money, they're still putting much more work into their hobbies. And they can't wait to get out of the work so they can go do their hobby at home. Some people like that also. Right? So you're right, there could be a combination of both. But we, at least we understand that the best way to do it is truly out of a connection to Tasha. Yeah? So let's, um, let's recap chapter four. So... In chapter two, we talked about the Dia Dei and the Neshama. The Neshama is a godly soul. That's what it is at the core. Chapter three, we learned about the Neshama's personality. It understands Hashem and feels for Hashem. Feelings include love and fear. In chapter four, we learned that the Neshama has three types of clothing. What are they? Uh, the actions, actions the thoughts, and, and speech. Yeah. Thoughts, speech, and actions. Those are the. Those are the. Clothing of the neshama. It's weird. Just like clothing, I put myself into clothing. So these are clothing of the neshama where the neshama puts its feelings for Hashem. It puts its feelings for Hashem, love and fear, into thought, speech, and action of Torah and mitzvahs. Then we learned another thing about mitzvahs. Mitzvahs are not only a way for the neshama to express its love for Hashem, but the mitzvahs themselves are the only way that we can relate to Hashem. Because Hashem is beyond anything. As big as our love is, and as big as our fear is, and as much as we understand, we do not going to come any bit closer to Hashem because He's beyond anything. So how do we connect to Hashem? Oh, good question. We'll get to that in a second. I'll get to answer that question in a second. So how do we connect to Hashem? We have to connect to Hashem in such a way that Hashem tells us, here's how you connect to me. 
When Hashem says, my dear child, can you please put on tefillin? Please, can you keep Shabbos? Because I want to spend some time with you. I want to give you a hug. That's what the mitzvah is. Which means now, if I do a mitzvah without feeling for Hashem, is it still worth something? Is it still valuable? Yeah. Of course it is. Because I did what Hashem wanted. Like, for example, using that example before, of Stephen Harper asking me to pass him a cup of water. If I, if I liked... And you do it, you made a connection. Obviously. Right? That's the point. So even if I don't feel for Hashem, even if I'm not in the mood, but I did what Hashem wanted, so I made a connection. Because that action is Hashem's desire. It's what He wants. And it's where He put Himself. Hashem put Himself into mitzvahs. Like I put myself into clothing, Hashem puts himself into mitzvahs, and now we have a way to hug Hashem. And like when you speak the words of Torah, you speak the words of prayer, it's like you're giving Hashem a kiss. When you think of Torah and mitzvahs that way, it's a whole different appreciation. Something you look forward to. You, have the, you think about this. You have the opportunity every day, multiple times a day, to give Hashem a hug. And Hashem is waiting. No, you give me a hug already. That's what it is. So even if, for me, my feelings are much greater, but for Hashem, what's more important? The action, get it done. Give me that hug already. Put on the tefillin, shake my hand, give me a kiss, give me a hug, connect to me. That's what Hashem really wants. Hashem really wants a connection with me and you. That's correct. The love is the is a way to truly get those actions. Kavana without mitzvah, worth nothing. Oh, mitzvah without kavana. Mitzvah without kavana is a connection to Hashem. It's not a perfect connection. You know what it's like? It's like me telling my children I love you without saying without meaning it. So I still told them the words, but if I put my feelings into it, it's much better. Right? So the action is certainly the main thing, but it's even better if I put my feelings into it. That's right. It makes it a deeper connection. Because if I put on tefillin without feeling for Hashem, so what connected to Hashem? My arm connected to Hashem and my head connected to Hashem because that's where the tefillin are. But if I, if I put my kavana into it, then what connected to Hashem? Everything, even my kavana, even my feelings. So that's right. So the best way to do it is if I took all my understanding and all my feelings and I put it into the mitzvah. But if I have all the feelings in the world and I don't put it into the mitzvah, then I, did I get closer to Hashem? No. If I put on the mitzvah without feelings, did I connect to Hashem? If I do a mitzvah without feelings, did I connect? Absolutely. The best way is if I have feelings and the action. Okay? And tomorrow, God willing, we're going to get chapter 5 and we're going to learn about what the food for the neshama is. Something that you brought up earlier. Okay, we'll take a small break and we'll continue shortly.